general overview of lab values, check out my other lab values for occupational therapy made easy overview video before watching this video. This video is meant to be a deeper dive into complete butt counts, white blood cells, red blood cells for occupational therapy students and practitioners. Although blood only makes up about 8% of our body's tissues, it has a major role in our body function. Let's do a quick review of some medical terminology because this will really help you understand the content for this video. A means without, like anemia. Macro means large. Micro means small. Poly means many. Erythro means red. So erythrocyte means red cell or red blood cell. Leuco means white. So leukocyte means white blood cell. Thrombo means clotting. So thrombocytes go to form blood clots. Heme or hemo means blood. Mono means one and only or single as in monocyte. Baso means base such as attraction to bases in chemistry, the opposite of acids. Blast means an embryonic cell. Eosino means dawn or rose colored. Interestingly, eosinophils can appear rose colored when stained with a dye. Lymph is easy. It means lymph or resembling lymph. Neutro means neutral or neither. So visually, neutrophils are leukocytes or white blood cells that stain easily with neutral dyes. The suffix site means cell. Penia means lack of or deficiency. Emia means a blood condition like anemia. Globin means protein like hemoglobin. Osis means abnormal conditions such as leukocytosis. Phil means attraction for, like neutral fill. Blood is categorized by the ABO system. So you can be blood type A, blood type B, blood type AB, or blood type O. A type and O type are the most common, which make up about 40 to 45% of the population. Then B type makes up about 10% of the population, and AB type is more rare, which is about 4% of the population. Blood contains something called plasma. What does it do? The main role of plasma is a fluid medium. That makes up the nutrients, hormones, proteins to the parts of the body that need it. Cells also put their waste products into this plasma. The plasma then helps to remove wastes from the body in the cellular level. Blood plasma also carries all parts of the blood through your circulatory system in your body. You may have heard of the term serum. Serology is the study of serum or the study of the antigens and antibodies in the serum. Serum is actually a product of plasma. Serum is a portion of the blood that does not do the clotting. It is the blood without the clotting factors or they are removed artificially in the lab. Serum is made of electrolytes, antibodies, antigens, and hormones. One thing to keep in mind is that serum does not contain white blood cells, red blood cells, or platelets, also known as the clotting factors. Let's take a look at blood composition. About 55% of the total blood volume is plasma. The remaining 45% are elements that make up the leukocytes, erythrocytes, and thrombocytes. What I find fascinating is the importance of the role of the white blood cells in platelets, and they only make up less than 1% of the blood. The rest, about 44%, are red blood cells or erythrocytes. We do need that oxygen for our hemoglobin too, right? Remember the mnemonic in anatomy, never let monkeys eat bananas? The first letter of each of those words in that phrase can actually help us remember neutrophils, lymphocytes, monocytes, eosinophils, and basophils, which are the white blood cells in our blood. A CBC, or complete blood count, is a common panel of lab tests that occupational therapists may encounter in, in the EMR or electronic medical record. CBC, as the name implies, com includes both red and white blood samples, and platelets as well because it is part of the blood too. Overall, the purpose of a CBC is to help assess for diseases, to help with making a diagnosis for doctors, or to help the medical team monitor how medical treatments are doing, such as drug doses for nurses. The CBC includes white blood cells, which are called leukocytes. Remember earlier, leuco means white? To remember this, think of the disease leukemia. Leukemia is a cancer affecting white blood cells. In leukemia, the white blood cells don't function like normal, and as cancer involves too much of the cell division, 
the white blood cells divide too quickly and eventually crowd out the other normal cells, including the red ones. So represented as a picture graphically, there are less red blood cells in a non-leukemia patient compared to a leukemia patient, who is likely ha to have less. Leukocytosis means white blood cells trending upward. Leukopenia means the opposite, white blood cells trending downward. Another downward trend is neutropenia, which is the general trending down of neutrophils. The mnemonic that I mentioned earlier, never let monkeys eat bananas, also happens to be the order for the average of higher percentage to lower percentage of the cell makeup. So about 60% of white blood cells are neutrophils, but only on the opposite, 1% are basophils. Let's talk about clinical presentation. In general, an increased white blood count can be a sign of infection. Leukocytosis can also be due to inflammation, malignancy, trauma, dehydration, tissue injury, even stress. Patients with an increased white blood count may present with fever, lethargy, dizziness, bruising, and painful joints. What about the opposite? Causes of low blood count include anemia, HIV, autoimmune disorders, and diabetes. Patients with low white blood count may present with weakness, fatigue, headache, and dyspnea, or difficulty breathing. Timing is important when it comes to leukocytes. White blood count is often lowest in the morning and peaks in the late afternoon. So if you're working with a patient with a trending high white blood count, such as due to an infection, you may want to see them in the morning instead of in the afternoon because of these differences in levels generally. If you work on the oncology unit, for example, you will often see patients with leuco or neutropenia. With these patients, you should always follow standard precautions and perform good hand hygiene. Some signage will be up usually at the door requiring you to don a mask, gloves, maybe even a gown just to see the patient because of the risk of infection there for the patient. Patients also may be immunocompromised and patients who have infections will likely have decreased performance for therapy. So grade your activities accordingly and check their vitals often, such as oxygen demand and use. Depending on how low the white blood count is, patients with leukopenia may need to have therapy held altogether. In extremely low white blood count patients, such as values less than 500, Therapy can be extremely dangerous and even fatal. So be sure to check this lab value when you're working with patients on this unit or any type of population that may be immunocompromised, especially when it comes to fever. Fever may be the body's way of responding to infection. Use a symptom-based approach when determining how appropriate OT will be and the activity you will participate in for the, your patient as it's a balance between safety and immobility or deconditioning and getting them out of bed. And as each facility where you work and lab values may have different units, especially overseas outside of the US, I will not go over specific lab values because it could potentially be meaningless to you because of the units are different. Also because what may be critical for my facility and the protocols there may be different for you and your population and where you work and your standards. Also, any new research and data sets may make lab values that I mentioned today become outdated tomorrow because of conditions that are constantly evolving, such as COVID-19. I'm not saying to ignore or not be familiar with lab values and ranges, but this video is meant to be more of an overview of the purpose, terms, anatomy, and physiology causes presentation for the clinical implications. Also, don't forget you can always look up some of this stuff in your EMR or online. Before we go into red blood cells, which often get a lot of attention, let's give more attention to platelets. Platelets or thrombocytes are the smallest elements found in blood. They are actually not cells, but cellular fragments. They help with blood clotting when there is an injury or trauma to a vessel wall. Their role is to help the control of bleeding. Hemostasis involves a complex series of reactions of three distinct steps from the moment that you bleed and bleeding occurs to the blood fully forming a clot and doing its thing at that localized location. The platelets are already found in the blood and they become more sticky and aggregate at the injury site to prevent additional blood loss. In step two, clotting factors then release thromboplastin to initiate clot formation. 
Finally, in step three, fibrinogen, which is a soluble protein in the blood, becomes insoluble and forms strands of fibrin, kind of like a net to help trap red blood cells and prevent bleeding. This creates a mass of fibrin and other blood cells called a thrombus, and that's how you get a blood clot. When platelets trend up, it's called thrombocytosis. When platelets trend down, it's called thrombocytopenia. While the causes of increased platelets can be for many reasons, the general reasons are due to inflammation, stress, infection, or trauma. The general cause for a decrease in platelet is infection, a deficiency such as dietary, radiation, and or chemo, cancer, or anemia. Basically, too little of something or due to something damaging the cell such as radiation or chemotherapy. When platelets trend down, what do you think will happen to the patient's clotting ability? It will be more difficult, right? So when platelets decrease significantly, the body is at an increased risk of spontaneous hemorrhage or bleeding out. This is something to be cautious about, especially when mobilizing patients or doing exercises that are especially more strenuous. What about the opposite? When platelets trend up, overclotting, right? The risk is not so much of the clotting part, but the risk of the clot being dislodged or a thromboembolism, which is defined as an obstruction of a blood vessel by a blood clot that has become dislodged from another site elsewhere in the circulation system. Now let's talk about the red blood cells. In terms of lab values, the two that you will likely see are hemoglobin and hematocrit. Hemoglobin is the protein molecule in the red blood cells that carries oxygen, and returns carbon dioxide. For hemoglobin, when iron atoms are not bound to oxygen, they appear dull red. But when iron atoms bind to oxygen, the entire heme group folds in such a way that structurally that it goes from a domed shape to a flat shape, which changes its color from dull red to actually bright red. The hemoglobin lab value helps to assess for anemia, blood loss, and is a side effect for chemotherapy as well, or even drugs that affect the immune system called bone marrow suppression. When hemoglobin trends upward, it is called polycythemia. When hemoglobin trends down, it is called anemia. Polycythemia can be caused by heart disease, COPD, CHF, severe burns, and dehydration. Patients may present with presyncope, dizziness, seizures, arrhythmias, and angina. If you try to think of these conditions such as CHF and COPD, it makes sense that you may also get symptom exacerbation associated with these conditions. With polycythemia, look out for low and high critical hemoglobin values as this can lead to heart failure, death, or vascular issues such as capillaries becoming clogged. This reminds me of sickle cell disease. It kind of makes sense because you have increased hemoglobin or red blood cells associated with this. The opposite in the causes of why hemoglobin may be trending downwards can be due to hemorrhage, poor nutrition, bone marrow stress, and red blood cell destruction. Conditions include renal disease, lupus, lymphoma, splenomegaly, and sickle cell anemia. Overall, patients will present with decreased everything really across the board and increased tachycardia because the body can't keep up. So decreased endurance and activity tolerance. They may look a little bit more pale too due to the decrease in hemoglobin physically. Another thing to look out for are blood transfusions and how stable patients are, especially if they recently have been anemic. Ask the nurse if therapy should be held or not if you see this in the chart. The last thing I will cover is hematocrit, which also helps to assess for blood and fluid levels in the body. What is hematocrit exactly? Hematocrit is the ratio of the volume of red blood cells to the total volume of blood. This is convenient because medical terminology tells us that the suffix crit means to separate, probably due to how they get hematocrit from centrifuging blood in the tube. When hematocrit trends up and down, the same terms are used for hemoglobin, polycythemia and anemia respectively. While some of the causes of why they trend up and down are similar to hemoglobin, there are also some differences. For example, polycythemia, as evidenced by an increased hematocrit, may also be due to eclampsia. Anemia for hematocrit may also be due to pregnancy, hyperthyroidism, cirrhosis, and rheumatoid arthritis. When patients trend upward with hematocrit, 
They may run a fever, have general weakness, and bruise easier as well. When trending down with hematocrit, they may have angina, arrhythmias, and dyspnea. Similar to hemoglobin, you'll want to watch out for these critical lab values as they can lead to cardiac failure, death, or even spontaneous blood clotting. So overall, as an occupational therapy practitioner, it is definitely helpful to follow your intuition and use a symptom-based approach when determining whether therapy is appropriate or not, even if the nurse or team says it's okay for therapy. Pay special attention to your patient's chief complaint, how they present, how they perform physically, combined with the lab values that you get before you start, and you will probably just do fine. And when in doubt, take some vitals just to see the values from the machine. This was a long video, but packed with a lot of good information. I recommend that you rewatch it a couple times to get the most out of the lab values and related conditions, symptoms, and clinical considerations when it comes to therapy. Thanks for watching and give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to this channel if you found it helpful. I'm Jeff the OT Dude and have a nice day.